Hey, South Hills Church. Today, I have a special occasion for you. I want to just give you a little background of who we are as a church and the decisions that are made at the church, how they are overseen by someone else besides me. At our organization, South Hills Church, we have a board overseeing all of our decisions so that we can remain in line with listening to God's voice and so that you as a congregation know that there is responsibility and accountability not only on the senior pastor but on the campus pastors as well. So today I'm gonna to be introducing to you who our South Hills board is and their heart behind serving God and serving the local church. So guys, we're gonna take a moment right now and I want you guys to introduce yourself to our church. Let them know who you are, give them your name, the campus you attend to. And I also want you to take a moment and answer the question of why you serve on our board and even at the local campus. For those of you who don't know, uh, Chris and his wife, Laura, are the founding pastors of South Hills Church. And today we are the church who we are because of the heart of the founding pastors. So Chris, say hello to your church that you started 25 years ago, but also introduce yourself to those who don't know who you are. Yeah, my name is Chris Songson, and uh, as Moses was talking about, we are the founding pastors of South Hills Church. Started in March 29th, 1998, and about a year and a half ago, felt like God was calling us to a different season. And uh, no doubt in my mind that Moses was the guy to take it over. So right now, uh, I'm helping to expand South Hills and other states, but also serving on the board. My name is Tom Fredrickson, and I attend South Hills Corona Campus. I uh, wanted to volunteer my time and share the expertise that I learned in churches is run as a business and sometimes it takes business people to help make the decisions to make sure that we're going in the right direction. I'm Roger Batchelder. I attend the South Hills Manhattan Beach campus. What I'm enjoying about being on the board is just you know having visibility into the direction of the church and, and being able to, to weigh in utilizing you know my experience of been in church for years and also just my experience in business. Hi I'm Blair Minnis. I attend South Hills Costa Mesa and I enjoy seeing the inner workings of South Hills Church. It gives me an idea of the direction the church is heading. I also get to have some input in the direction the church is heading. And it's very important, like, like a family, South Hills is my family. One of the aspects that gives me a lot of fulfillment is the camaraderie that we get with other volunteers and the friendships that we create within that. We are here to support not only the congregation as a whole, but the people that run it. That's the staff and especially our uh, senior pastor, Moses. I love serving on the board. Uh, it's a new role for me. I mean, I've always been on the board, but not in that seat. It has more of a serving role, which I enjoy because it is the way God's designed us. We're designed to serve. Or really because it's good for us. It's good for us in that we grow closer to the Lord. There is more joy that is brought by serving by helping other individuals within the church, by bringing people from outside of the church into the church. The mission of this church is to bring people to Christ and uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Guys, I just wanna say thank you for taking the time uh, to coming out and allowing the church to get to know you, to hear your heart. I wanted them to know who our South Hills board is so that they can feel comfort and security knowing that not just the pastors are making decisions of the church, but there is accountability from an aerial view of who we are as a church and that we're going in the right direction. South Hills, I hope you enjoyed today getting to know who our South Hills board is. so much for joining us today um, as we are midway through this series that we jump-started last week called Not Interested. 
And uh, we're talking about three reasons rational people reject Christianity. And maybe you're sort of wondering, like, how do we come up with these reasons? And uh, how we sort of came to these three ideas is looking at a lot of research that has taken place uh, over the course of the past 10 years in our country about why people are not interested in faith or have walked away from faith, who have been hurt by faith, who want nothing to do with church and Christianity. And uh, if, if our goal is really to represent Christ well to the people around us, we want to know maybe where we're getting it wrong as people of God. And so we just decided to take these three ideas that it's sort of uh, like the culmination of all of this uh, wide-range survey research that's been done and, and really just talk directly to these things. And uh, so I, I hope today, whether you are a person that has been a Christ follower your whole life, maybe you've grown up in the church, uh, maybe you were here for the first time, maybe you saw an, an Instagram ad or somebody invited you, uh, maybe you're just like, I don't even know what I believe. Um, we are glad that you're here. And I hope that you lean in today and take notes and listen to what's being said and whether you agree with any of the stuff I'm talking about today or not, write some things down, take some pictures of the slides. And my real hope, my heart, is that you would walk away and have a conversation about what you're hearing and about what it means and about maybe what it implies and what, it, what action it begs of you personally. And uh, so today, uh, last week, we talked about this, this sort of uh, complaint or critique that Christianity breeds ignorant people who use the Bible to avoid reason. How many of you were here last week or got to hear this message um, online? Awesome. Um, and uh, this week, we're going to tackle this second concern. Christianity punishes anyone who thinks differently or asks difficult questions. And so, uh, again, uh, please take some notes today. Write some things down as we sort of follow along together. And the title of my message today is Smile and Nod. Smile and Nod. Um, I had this really uh, clear memory of being when I was a little kid, and I went to this, uh, specifically this kid. Um, oh, man, some rough times, some rough times. I, 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 anytime I show my daughter, like, old pictures of me, she's like, Dad, I mean, I feel like you've glowed up, you know? And I'm like, oh, thanks. She's like, well, not that much. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's not... But I remember being this kid, and I went to, uh, around this age, I went to this birthday party, and it was a birthday party at this kid's house, and just a bunch of guys hanging out. And um, as everybody's hanging out, um, somebody brought up the subject of French kissing. And uh, I, I was a sheltered pastor's kid, and I was like, I don't know, I don't know what that is. I don't know if you've ever been in an environment where somebody mentions something, especially as a kid, and, you're, and it look, you're looking around at everybody else's eyes to see who else is lost. Everyone else is projecting confidence, and you're just like, I think I'm the only one who doesn't know what's going on. I'd never heard that term. I didn't know what it was about. Um, I didn't know what French kissing was. I, I, I knew what French bread was. Uh, I, I mean, I guess it was like a, I, whatever it was, maybe it had to do with garlic butter or something. I don't know. I didn't know. And I was, I was embarrassed and it was awkward. And I'm like, you know what? These are my friends. Like, it's cool. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say, like, I don't, you know, what, what, what is that? And so I was just like, hey, um, somebody else made a joke like, oh, but they were French kiss. And I was like, yeah. Hey, um, real quick, uh, what, what, what is, what is uh, French, French kissing? And they were like, everyone stopped. They all stared at me. And they're like, what? You don't know? Oh my God, this guy doesn't know what French kissing is. And I was like, well, I, I mean, what I, I, I do, I want to see if you guys know. <laughs> I mean, I've, I got the garlic butter back in my house. I have to do it all the time. Okay? You know? And they're like, this guy, he's, he's clueless. And I remember them laughing and pointing and like the whole rest of the birthday party sleepover, like people would make jokes about it and call back to it. And I mean, even now, like this was so many years ago, like decades ago, and I still, I still remember how I, I felt in that moment. Like just felt so stupid. And I, I remember feeling so much shame over just asking what felt like a really innocent question. And I mean, if you've had a moment like this before, you know these moments sort of stick with us. It's weird because I don't remember a lot about this uh, stage of life. When I look at this picture, there's not a lot of stories I remember about being this kid, but that's one of them. And I think it's weird that, that some of the stories that stick with us most are stories of shame, 
of stories of feeling ashamed. And, you know, I remember for so long afterwards just being like, I don't ever want to be in that position again. I don't ever want to feel those feelings. I don't ever want to be in that situation where I don't fit because there's something I don't know. And, I, you know, I believe that we all have this basic human need to belong. And so if admitting that we don't agree with those around us will get in the way of that belonging, sometimes it's just safer to go along than rock the boat and risk rejection. We just sort of smile and nod because we don't want to end up in a situation where we experience the shame of not knowing or not agreeing. And, you know, I, I wonder if you have been in this situation, maybe even recently, have you ever pretended to know something that you did not know? Maybe it wasn't even that big a deal, but like you were talking to somebody and they were like, ah, oh, I mean, you've obviously you've heard about the Saskatchewan sidestep, right? And you're like, yeah, totally. You have no idea what they're talking about. And you're racking your brain and you're like, I don't know what that title, it could be a political initiative, it could be a TikTok dance, it could be a Netflix show. I don't know what that is, you know what I mean? But you're just, you're like, yeah, and, and you're just sort of going along because you don't want to be embarrassed, even though you're a grown person, and who cares what it is? But you don't want to, like, hold up the flag and make it obvious in that moment that you don't know what they're talking about. And I know you've done this because everybody does it. And the reason we do it is because we all want to be seen as knowledgeable, capable, and relevant, not like the only idiot in the room who isn't in the know. And at times it feels like, listen, if you're not smart enough to already know the answer, it's probably too late to ask the question. And I think there are all sorts of things that we just don't want to admit after a certain age or stage that, that we don't know. Like we don't want to come clean and just be like, listen, I, I, know, I don't know how to change a tire, okay? I don't know how to fix a toilet. I don't know how to build a budget. I don't know how to monitor my kids' screen time, right? I, I, don't, I don't know how to manage this tension with my in-laws, right? I, I don't even know how to watch TV anymore. Has anybody else been frustrated about this recently? This is one of my chief frustrations, and I hate admitting it. Are you going to watch that? I'm like, yeah. And it's like, there's like, you know, uh, there's two receivers and 15 remotes and you got to get on the thing and all the thing, whatever. And then you click on the deal and then it's like, you need to get this app and you got to download the app. And then when you get the app, it's like, well, do you have the bundle package? And I'm like, I don't know if we have the bundle package. And then you got to enter the code and then they double check it. They send it to your phone and you got to find your phone and click on the thing. And then you do that. And then it sends you back to the website. And then you got to get that code sent to your phone and then forward from your phone to the thing, sync your phone with the receiver and then change the clock. You're like, I just want to watch the game. Why can't I just turn on the TV? It's so much. But you don't want to say that. I mean, how embarrassing is it to be like, I don't know how to watch TV anymore. I don't know how the TV works. And then if you're like me, your 12 year old is like, dad, it's so stupid. And it's just there. And I'm like, okay, but I'm still in charge. And I would argue that everyone you know is walking around pretending they know more than they do. And the reason I know this is because you do it. You do this too. But I think this issue is way deeper than a lot of these surface sort of things. I think we don't just have questions about how to live. I think we have really deep questions about what to build our lives on. Questions that sort of go below the surface. Questions about foundational things. And our initial impulse is when we have these questions to ask someone who seems like they have it all figured out. But that doesn't always go well. Because sometimes those with the most belief um, are the ones that are most difficult to confess your lack of belief to. Because when it comes to certain faith issues... Saying like, well, I don't know what I think about that, or I don't know what I believe about that, or I'm not totally convinced yet. The reaction from these people can sometimes be annoyance that you even dared to question something with such an obvious answer that you should already know and understand. But it doesn't feel obvious to you. Or, or maybe for you, it's that you grew up with certain black and white paradigms that you have realized might be a bit grayer than you originally assumed. 
And as your world expanded, so did the amount of ambiguity and tension that demanded to be considered and contextualized. And even if you don't see it, I'll tell you this, your kids do. And pretending they don't think this way doesn't make those thoughts go away. And here's the things that I think a lot of people are afraid to ask out loud. Like, does God even exist? How do we know the Bible can even be trusted? I mean, how can one man's murder save the entire world? Is God really going to make people burn in hell forever? Does prayer make a difference? Does it really even matter? Or are we just whispering to ourselves in the dark? Can I be like half Hindu? How, how does that work? Like, what is okay to, to ask questions about, wrestle with, or have a different take on, and what's not? And who do you ask these questions to? Because for a lot of people with nowhere to turn, we find ourselves silently struggling with our own secret crisis of faith. But suppressing doubt doesn't work. In reality, our deepest questions don't disappear just because we feel unsafe asking them. They just sit there. They grow. They mutate. They harden. And so for most of us, we do what, you know, any level-headed modern American would. Uh, we turn to TikTok for answers. Um, <laughs> right? Some of you are pretending like you don't know what I'm talking about, but you've done this before, right? You're like, listen, this 20-second reel on Biden triggering the apocalypse by at Doomsday Daryl 1776 was very convincing, okay? And then that single soundbite becomes what you believe about Christianity or the reason you can't believe in Christianity. And that's not great. Others of us are in a totally different place. Others of us have lived for so long with certain assumptions that questioning them now could be soul-shattering for us. So there's a lot of fear involved. We've already decided who we are and what we think about things. Our lifestyle and friendships are contingent on these beliefs. So anything that challenges them is enormously threatening. We're not going to ask certain questions, and we don't want other people asking those questions either, because just bringing them up dignifies them in a way we don't think they deserve. They're dangerous, they're identity ending, they're community collapsing. And the result of this mindset is a rigid religiosity that doesn't teach people how to think, but teaches them what to think. And the sentiment is like, if I'm afraid to engage with certain ideas or individuals, you should be too. We should all be. So we get advice like, listen, don't read these books or follow these accounts or listen to these thinkers. Don't watch these movies um, or from these people or listen to their music or go to their places of business. If anyone uh, you know says or posts anything that you remotely disagree with, distance yourself from them, even if they're your closest friends or your own flesh and blood. They're not anymore. They're canceled. We teach people they're wrong by destroying their lives and livelihoods. And if you don't want to join our witch hunt, it's probably because you're a witch. <laughs> a title that historically has come with unrecoverable consequences. You don't have to do a, a very deep dive into Christian history to see that in our recent history, Christians accused over 80,000 women of being witches and put half of them to death. Most for nothing more than nonconformity or for the obvious unforgivable sin of having a personality. <laughs> We've enslaved, attacked, and exterminated entire people groups in the name of Jesus. We've tried and tortured thousands, tens of thousands of nonconformists. We've designed devices specifically designed to inflict the maximum amount of pain, suffering, and humiliation on those who disagree with us. Innovations like the red X, the hair shirt, the strapado, 
the Judas cradle, the Spanish boot, the heretic's fork, the rack. Just so you use your imagination as to what these things are for. It's not great. And few of the people who did all of these things saw themselves as doing anything wrong. They were just doing what they had to do to defend their faith. And by the time we get to the fourth century, labeling someone a heretic actually gave you permission to brutalize any so-called non-believer in any way that you saw fit. And it was really difficult to defend yourself against because the accusation was essentially, you think differently than the rest of us, so you deserve to die. And here's the great irony in all of this. The early church was famously persecuted for being nonconformist, and then became famous for persecuting nonconformists. But in reality, our founder, Jesus, he never blacklisted, tortured, or killed anyone, including those who disagreed with him. The same cannot be said of the religion that bears his name, though. The religion that claims to follow him exclusively, and that's a problem. A problem that has made a lot of people want to have nothing to do with our faith. Jesus was a, a traveling rabbi, which essentially just means teacher. And he was constantly surrounded by disciples, which means students. And the rabbinic style of teaching was really interactive. It's different from sort of the classroom style that we have today. It was sort of out in the world, and it was, there was this back and forth cadence to it, and it required a lot of critical thinking and questioning and wrestling with God and the community around you. Because the ancient Jews believed that there is no discipleship without debate. That debate is essential to really understanding what it is you believe and how those beliefs work themselves out in the real world. In fact, uh, these people believed that this was part of their, an essential, inescapable part of their tradition. Um, the Jews really are, another name for them is the Israelites, the Israelite people. And an Israelite is, essentially just means one who wrestles with God. It comes from the story of Jacob who wrestles with God and his name is changed to Israel and his people become the Israelites because this is who they're going to be. It was assumed in this culture represented by this title that you would always have doubts. In fact, the synagogue or the church was where you went to openly ask your questions, not the place you wouldn't go if you weren't sure upon all of the pre-agreed upon answers. In fact, some of the people closest to Jesus asked questions of him that most of the churches that I think a lot of us grew up in would be offended by. I want to read you um, an excerpt from a story that I think really sort of exemplifies this. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 2, it says this. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the things Jesus was doing. And so he sent his disciples, his students... To ask Jesus, are you the one we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Are you the Messiah? Are you God in human form? Can you be trusted? Is Jesus really the Son of God? These are big questions. And maybe you don't know much about John. I'll give you a quick rundown of who he was. John was this well-known wilderness prophet. He was very eccentric. He lived in the woods, and he didn't dress like other people, and his beard was shaggy, and he ate bugs. It's in the Bible, you guys. And he's confined to prison because his influence is growing at such a rate that it's making the government nervous, that he has too much power, and so they want him dead. And so he's in prison awaiting execution, and while he's there waiting and just sitting and thinking about his life, he sends his students to go ask Jesus, did John, did I, did John Waste his life devoting it to you, Jesus. Which is sort of a shocking question at this point in his life. John had probably more firsthand evidence of Jesus' deity than anyone else. But here, in the face of death, he doubts. Because that's what people do when they're desperate, even prophets. This is natural and normal. It says in verse 4 that Jesus told them, Go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, 
the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And so Jesus answers their question by quoting a piece of poetry from somewhere else in Scripture, which again is very rabbinic, because it's about this, I'm not going to give you the easy answer, I'm going to throw something at you that requires you to critically think and ask more questions and wrestle with what's actually going on here. And Jesus is true to form in this moment. He wants John to decide for himself the answer to this question based on Jesus' actions, not his answers. Because that's what rabbis do. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus doesn't shame John for asking him the question. Because that's what disciples do. They ask questions. They're students. They're always learning. And in this moment, Jesus demonstrates that he's a safe person to bring your deepest doubts, questions, and concerns to. And I would argue that if our goal as his disciples is to be like him, we ought to be safe people for others to bring their doubts, questions, and concerns to. Does that describe you? There are multiple moments in the New Testament where, where Jesus turns to his disciples and says something like, do you still not know? Like, or he'll say, are you still so dull? Or have you not figured this out yet? Or how are you still asking the same question? And the thing you need to know about Jesus is that he's really funny, which we don't get a lot of the humor because it's contextualized in culture. But he's funny, and he sort of says this sarcastically. But these guys that he's talking to in this moment, they grew up in his culture, speaking his language, and had been following him every step of the way. And yet the point of this idea here is that their personal preferences, beliefs, and biases are still preventing them from seeing the truth that's been standing in front of them the whole time. And I would argue that it is even more likely that there are things that you still don't know about God, Scripture, and morality. But here's our issue. We don't want to be a student. We want to be the teacher. We don't want to be a follower. We want to be the leader. We don't want to ask questions. We want to be the person who already has all the answers. And this is not exclusive to us. This is a prideful human condition that Jesus came to break us of. And not only are we this way, the people in Jesus' day, the religious people were this way as well. They built these elaborate lists of things that you had to believe and uh, all these things about how you had to behave to keep yourself from losing God's love or the acceptance of your community. But the problem was people still had questions. Just because they had given everybody an easy answer, people still had questions. And a lot of them were the same sort of questions that you and I still have today. But the rigid traditionalists of Jesus' day had no place for it. Their attitude was conform or be condemned. And Jesus had some words for these people in many different places. I'll read you one of my favorite examples. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. This is Jesus talking. He says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What sorrow awaits you, hypocrites? You shut the door of heaven in people's faces, and you won't go in yourselves. You'll travel the world to make one convert and then turn that person into twice the child of hell you are. Let me remind you, this is Jesus talking to religious people about their religious rules and expectations. It sounds really harsh. I wonder if you have the same question I do when I read this. I'm like, what makes someone a child of hell? That sounds rough. I don't want to be that. And according to this context and, and, and what, how Jesus talks about this idea, a child of hell is someone who creates unnecessary barriers to a relationship with God. And so Jesus would say to you, if you are a religious person 
who is stacking up a bunch of unnecessary barriers to someone getting to experience and understand and interact in a real relationship with God, Jesus would say, you're acting like a real child of hell right now. Which I think brings up the question, like, then what is necessary for a relationship with God? The Apostle Paul reduced it to this. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That's it. And, and I get that there are some of you that are just like, I don't, not even really sure I can do that much, just to be real with you. And if that's you, I just want you to know, you're welcome here too. Even if you never change your mind. Because that's what a faith community ought to be. People asking thoughtful questions earnestly seeking to understand what Scripture says and wrestling with how to live it out in a way that honors Jesus. And here's the reality. We are not going to agree on everything. That's okay. In fact, this may shock you. That's the design. That's God's design for the church. That we would have different experiences and perspectives that cause us when we come together to reflect God's design and desire for all of humanity. Which means if, 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 even if you've been pushed out the door before, you get to be part of the family, including those who still have a lot of questions about the Old Testament or are still trying to figure out their sexuality or kind of think Buddha had a couple good quotes. Because according to Jesus and according to the New Testament believers, a true Christian makes room for differing perspectives, models the way of Jesus, and mindfully wrestles with their own faith. But we don't want to wrestle with our faith. We want to wrestle other people about their faith. <laughs> and that is a no-no in the NT, Okay. Something that in the New Testament, it's like, listen, if, if you're going around trying to control what everyone else thinks, believes, and how they behave, you're sort of missing the point. This is how Paul, what's something Paul says to the church people in Rome, Romans chapter 14, verse 1, he says this, except other believers whose faith is fragile. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Now, I want you to understand something. When you read the whole, if you were to go and read this whole chapter, what you realize is sometimes we think like, oh, someone's faith is fragile if, you know, they're, they're sort of, they have very few boundaries. But actually, the way that Paul is using this phrase is like people that have to like, the faith is very narrow for them. These people are those whose faith is fragile. It's those who actually can live a life of faith in many different circumstances, situations, experiences, like who don't get swayed or bent out of shape by someone else having a different idea or preference or thought on something. These are the people whose faith is actually strong. And what essentially Paul is trying to say here is, don't die on every hill. Most things are not as important as you think they are. Everyone else doesn't have to fall in line with your personal convictions. They don't have to side with you to share your faith. Because in reality, not everyone you dislike or disagree with is a heretic or false prophet. So stop acting like it. You're giving Christianity a bad name. Now let me ask you this, because I think it's easy to point fingers at everybody else. Who do you, argue with at a distance to avoid having to care about up close. Because I think often this is our tactic. Like, oh, I, I'm, I, I got a post. I'm going to share something. I'm going to tell somebody what I think. What, do you actually know anybody who's, who's going through that situation? Well, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't do that. I wouldn't get about around those people. I, don't have, I wouldn't have any friends that think that way or do this or are affected by this. I think sometimes we, 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 we just want to fight 
so that we can avoid having to actually face ourselves. I know a, a guy who tattooed the, the word learner on his wrist. And the reason he did this was to sort of remind himself of the primary posture that he wanted to take during his life in every situation. He tended like to talk with his hands. And so when he got in conversations with people, his thought was, I'm going to have to look past my tattooed wrist at the face of the person I'm talking to and gesturing at. And it was his way of sort of telling himself, if you are lecturing instead of listening right now, you've missed the mark. Remember, you're a learner. You're a student. To use biblical language, you're a disciple. Matthew chapter 11, verse 10, back in our story. It says, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking to the crowds intentionally so these people could over, overhear him. What kind of man did all you people go into the wilderness to see? Were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? Well, again, John the Baptist was a wilderness prophet who was eccentric. He lived in the woods. He did not wear fancy clothes, just FYI. And Jesus is saying, like, John you weren't what people expected. And because of that, people missed the significance of what it was you were actually saying because they were so sidetracked and couldn't get past your packaging. And here's the thing I want you to understand as you're sitting in prison. I'm not what people expected either, including you. In verse 19, it says this, and Jesus is talking about himself, and he says, people see me feasting and drinking, and the religious say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. And you know what this verse tells us? If you have ever been labeled a heretic, you're in good company, because Jesus was often. And the reason he was, was for noble reasoning, because instead of looking down on those who, who had questions or doubts, shaming them for their nonconformity, he had an interesting strategy. He went out to eat with them. He sat around for hours over drinks, laughed and listened to their stories and asked sincere questions about their past hurts and their points of view. In other words, and, and I want you to grab hold of this. Jesus, the only person, the only one who literally knew it all, approached others with the humble relational posture of a learner, not a lecturer. And then he invites us, his followers, to follow his lead. This is what our movement was based on. This is who our movement was based on. Interesting that although Jesus knows everything that actually is true and everything that actually is best for people, even though he knows people better than they know themselves, he sits, humbles himself, builds a relationship by exploring who they think they are. And beginning a journey with them from that point forward. And I just wonder, like, what would happen if instead of repeating our violence-ridden, heresy-hunting church history, we chose to focus on aligning our everyday lives with the words and way of Jesus? That, by the way, is our, our first and most important value here at South Hills Church, that we aim to align our everyday lives with the words and way of Jesus. That's Christianity. And the first century followers who lived life alongside Jesus, they seemed to think that it was going to change the world. Just doing that, just focusing on that. And I wonder, what if they were right? What if instead of just sort of smiling and nodding and going along, what if you actually had the courage to bring your real questions 
to Jesus? And what if in that process you allowed Jesus to make you a safe person for other people to bring their questions to? What if you became this this person that others knew that when you are really going through it, they can go to you and you will treat them like Jesus? That you will see them that you will lean in to them, that you will ask questions, that you will seek to learn, that you will approach them with humility and grace and love, and you will walk them with your actions, not your answers, towards what and who you place your faith and trust in. This is Christianity. I think this question and concern that a lot of people have totally dissolves if we take this idea seriously. And I think we should because anything else really isn't Christianity. Would you bow your heads across this room? I want to just pray this into our lives today. God, we are very grateful for your grace, love, and mercy in our life. And the thing that we are so happy to receive from you is oftentimes the thing that over time we have a hard time giving away to others. God, you are full of grace and truth and it's how you demonstrate the truth that you are. It shows us how to demonstrate the truth that you've given us. And God, I pray that we would be people who despite what we think about all these issues, that we would maintain a focus on who you are, on your sacrifice, on your life, on your teachings, on your way of being. And God, as we do, may we become more like you. And may people begin to see Christianity as a bunch of people who have humbly submitted themselves to Jesus, not pridefully push others around about issues that although important, you put as secondary to simply following you. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.